stranger to the AA, having taught here for quite a while, I'm sure he's very glad to be back in this venerable lecture hall, even if only for a very brief period. Uh, his last exhibition here at the, uh, in London in the White Cube managed the, uh, the miracle of expanding all our heads, and I think he's probably going to do the same again tonight. Yes? Very good. <laughs> I've um, prepared some slides to show you of recent and uh, some not so recent work, but work done in the past in the main in the past uh, three years, four years in the case of the first two slides. And I think the thing to do, because um, I've never done this before, I've never sort of st stood in front of an audience and showed the slides of my work. It's always been a bit more uh, performative. So what I've done in the past, and as I made films and videotapes in the past, uh, there was a kind of du durational aspect to that. So you could actually kind of sit and watch the film where I could be quiet and then kind of answer questions afterwards. So I'm not uh, familiar or entirely happy with speaking, being, a, I mean, making a commentary on my work, because I think um, it's just a bit boring to just sort of point to slides and just say, I did this, I did this, I did this. It, so I'd prefer, in a way, to run through some of these pictures with you. There are two slide projectors and I think something like 84 slides in total. And um, open it up to um, questions or things that you might want to comment on or say fairly early on rather than kind of um, labor the point. So we'll start with the first two slides. What I'll do is probably just run through and uh, uh, give a brief description of um, the circumstances that they're, they're, these things are. They're all, I think all, are installation shots um, from the various exhibitions. This is, um, these are five photographs, and um, <coughs> they're actually photographs of the um, greatly magnified particles of photographic emulsion and they're printed on the uh, paper which is coated with a corresponding emulsion. Um, <coughs> suppose uh, an attempt to, I don't know, I found the photographs quite interesting when I came across them and had them further enlarged in order to make this piece of work. I think I wanted to make, um, I felt that somehow there was, there was something very interesting about them as images. And um, given that uh, people could understand that they were, in fact, uh, images of the nature of an image, you see what I mean, that uh, they were the sort of building blocks for an image as an image. This uh, is in the same show. And <coughs> there are two pieces here. The piece on the right-hand side is uh, they were found reels of audio tape, two-inch audio tape, um, which I found outside a recording studio, in a skip outside a recording studio here in London. The show is in New York, and um, I had no idea what was on them, and it would require um, <coughs> me to get hold of sort of professional facilities for me to be able to put them on. So I, in fact, took them to New York um, with an idea of doing something with them. and. Um, at the time, I was sort of quite interested in, in presenting information which was sort of tough or slightly challenging to access, in a sense. So I was interested in presenting something of the nature of a, of a kind of crypt, really, of something which uh, was um, sealed and you had no real access to what was inside it, uh, only being sort of told. And so I, I wanted it to be fairly vague as to what was on these things. I didn't know initially. I subsequently found out and was quite, um, I don't know, quite pleased, quite delighted, in fact, to find out that they were, in fact, um, sound mixes from a Rod Stewart single called Downtown Train. Uh, the bit on the right-hand side is a uh, one kilowatt HMI daylight matching lamp with a transformer on the floor. That's pointing at a three-meter length of videotape, which you can sort of see there hanging Sorry, we're going the wrong direction. There, you see, this is, this is the length of um, videotape which um, 
I think I calculated at some point that uh, three meters um, was something like 27 seconds of playing time on this uh, umatic videotape. And the image on the tape, if you were to, in fact, to kind of load it into a cassette and be able to play it, is in fact my signature. So I wanted in some way, in that show, to kind of present something which was uh, willfully inaccessible. Uh, <coughs> no less willful, the next show. Sorry. Two shots similar. Um, it was a show held here in London. A group show curated by <coughs> Gregor Muir. And... Um, there were four artists in the show, and there was a building which had four floors, and we decided that we would take a floor each. So the building was, in fact, being <coughs> converted from what originally had been a warehouse building in Hoxton Square to a uh, now rather expensive um, studio properties for uh, artists, designers. So um, the building was in some sort of state of being made ready, being made good so that they could change the, 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 the character of the building so that they could make money by renting it out, basically. So we went into the building. There was actually quite a lot of work to do. And um, it, part of setting up the show, since I didn't have a piece in mind that I wanted to place in there, was partly the preparing of the space itself. So I can't say that I learnt to, because I'm, I, I wasn't very good at it, but... Um, kind of came close to learning how to plaster a wall and do things like that. Um, I don't know why I'm mentioning it, or whether I, whether I should be proud of that at all, but um, it was part of a process of setting up, setting up this piece of work. Um, it's, it's a complicated piece of work, and it, to a certain extent, I'm not sure how much it would help to, to go into it very much. Um, I can just mention that the text on the wall um, is a Lawrence Wiener piece which is owned by um, the Museum of the 20th Century in Vienna. And uh, in English, it, on the top line it says, just another elapsia of time designated, and uh, has its German translation underneath. Um, I tried to sort of appropriate everything. I mean, I, it was a show of appropriating things and then sort of twisting them or sort of messing about with them somehow. So I changed the... I kept the text as it was, but I ran it across a corner, whereas the original piece is in intended to be in a straight line. And as you can see, I hung a drawing on top of it, further kind of uh, blocking something that, that, that could be gotten from the piece. Um, the piece was called, this piece was called, um, And What Does Moderato Cantabile Mean?, which is the opening sentence in... Uh, novel called Moderato Cantabile by Margaret, Marguerite Duras and uh, there's a sort of stubbornness that runs through the, uh, the opening scene of this, uh, of this book where a little boy is very reluctant to uh, take piano lessons and the piano teacher knows very well that she knows the boy knows what Moderato Cantabile means but the little boy is stubborn and refuses to uh, refuses to answer <coughs> The uh, drawing is a drawing of a friend of mine uh, by another friend of mine. The potted palm is a sort of uh, mark of respect or a kind of nod to Marcel Brotteus. And the uh, table that it sits on is, in fact, um, a table which I um, acquired... Um, through, <coughs> it's not that complicated. Um, I used to model for Lucian Freud. I uh, used to be an, an artist model for him. When his mother died, uh, the family were emptying the house. Uh, his father was given this table by his father, Sigmund Freud. So it's a, it's a, a piece of furniture that once belonged to Sigmund Freud. It's a rather beaten up and kind of badly repaired, which is why I don't think anyone really wanted it. Uh, it's an 18th century Chinese table of some kind. The image on the left-hand side is, as you can see, a stuffed magpie, and in its mouth it's holding a scarf, which has... Sorry, this is the... We'll come back to that. We're jumping the gun here a bit, but we'll probably come back to it. How can I go backwards? Reverse, obviously. Um, 
the image on the scarf is, in fact, a um, screen print. It was printed on in bleach. I wanted to uh, make something that was uh, very, I think, ephemeral and slightly, in, in some sense, sort of throwaway. Wanted to uh, contaminate things by possibly referencing notions of fashion and the idea of making something uh, with the associations that a silk chiffon scarf has. The image which is printed on, on, onto the scarf is a, an image of myself dressed up as um, Baptiste, the central male character in uh, Marcel Carnet's Les Enfants du Paradis. Um, more than just kind of spell out the, uh, some of the the roots, some of the connections, some of the, uh, some of the different objects, if you like. I mean, I suppose I think about, about it in those terms, that each of these things is a kind of separate object that I can bring together in some sense to uh, uh, work with and against each other. Um, getting really confused now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got the hang of it. Um, this sign, there's, uh, there's a neon, I made a neon sign. Um, it came about by being, uh, being in a situation that I was very, uh, by accident, that um, I got locked in a cinema, in a door between the exit door to the cinema and the street while the film was on. <laughs> and I was so embarrassed by the fact that I was locked there and would have to, in fact, I stormed out of the cinema because I hated the film so much. I was in a really bad mood. And went through this fire door to leave to realize that the door closed behind me and I was trapped in this space, which was quite a small space. It was um, the Odeon in Leicester Square. And I suppose I should have done something about it because it's a very dangerous thing to do. Had there been a fire, someone could have got seriously hurt. But so I'd sort of stormed out something like 15 minutes into the film and knew that the friends, there were two friends of mine still in the audience just going, oh, you know, ugh, throwing a tantrum and running off the film. I can't remember, it was, some, it was uh, some kind of American adventure film. And uh, I felt annoyed with myself for having kind of been lured into kind of going to see it in the first place. But it meant that I had an uncomfortable something like 70 minutes in this space. And the only thing I could see was this reversed exit sign. I was obviously on the wrong side of somewhere that and um, then I got quite excited because I thought, wow, look at that. And somehow just kind of, it symbolized being on the wrong side of something, which I thought was, uh, was not a bad thing to uh, reproduce or, or maintain in a sense. Um, I don't know how many of you can see the image on the, the drawing now, which is on this, 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 this wall. Unfortunately, the uh, room was long and narrow, so it wasn't possible to, uh, it wasn't possible to take photographs that could show you, in fact, the way in which the work uh, operated in the space, because it was actually only possible to take both sides independently. Um, the exit sign, which was on the uh, wall, as you can see it there, uh, was, th was then reflected in uh, the glass on the surface of the portrait. So from a certain angle, you could see whenever the sign is reflected, obviously you read it the, uh, as it were, <coughs> the correct way or the reverse way around, which is the way that you would expect to read it. Um, consequently, this, this kind of egg, putting a kind of, sort of projecting an exit on this face had a, uh, had a very particular um, importance for me at the time. More shots of this bird, this time in a glass case. They all had kind of rather kind of uh, irritating titles as well. The piece on the right hand side, a uh, bunch of peonies that are growing in a mixture of alcohol and urine. The urine pr produced by myself having drunk the uh, remainder of the bottle of alcohol. Um, so I was kind of growing these uh, rather kind of poisonous alcoholic flowers. Um, that piece I entitled. Um, it's, um, it's partly sexual, of course, but mainly spiritual, which was a kind of punchline from a joke from the New Yorker, which fi pictured a woman wearing a mink coat walking down Park Avenue. And this is what she was saying.
These are <coughs> two sides of the same piece of paper. They are the signs that you would, uh, they're, the, they're the Euro City 64 Mozart direction signs. Um, when you're in Paris, you get to the platform and it, you see that it says, if, if, you're, if you're in Paris and you're on your way to Vienna, you see the sign on the right hand side. If you're in uh, Vienna and you're on your way back to or to Paris, you see the sign on the left hand side. And I was, uh, I was ex very excited by this, by this sign, somehow the idea that that journey is made and what the uh, what the, 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 I don't know, the, the, the history of that journey is also uh, uh, an extraordinary one. And the idea of somehow the act of a person that's at either end of this journey negotiating this sign and literally just turning it round the other way um, had a kind of uh, a resonance for me. This is a <coughs> Phalaenopsis orchid. Uh, on the left hand side, on the right hand side is a um, film lamp. Um, it's a bit dumb, this combination. But um, I managed to briefly, I've done it three times in total, by treating, uh, treating flowers with a mixture of um, phosphorescent dye and uh, feeding them with a particular, particular kind of combination. You can get them very briefly to um, to have properties, the petals have properties of being phosphorescent. So when you shine a light on them and then switch the light off for a brief period of time, they glow in the dark. I think there's a projector, there's a slide that's stuck somewhere. This is um, <laughs> this is a monochrome painting glowing in the dark. <laughs> the other slide uh, should show you um, the painting with the light on. Uh, when the light goes off, I mean, I'm sure all of this is perfectly clear to you. It was initially made as a... I had a night reading. Um, I had something called um, an itty-bitty book light, which was... Um, a device made by a company called Pifco that you could strap onto the back of your book and um, plug it in and you could read by it. So it meant that you could actually kind of read in bed without having to um, get up and switch the lights off. So uh, this broke and I had some of this phosphorescent stuff from treating the flowers with it and I thought I'd make a cover a surface in it because I realised at some points that you could kind of read by the light that this thing gave off. So, in fact, it's a sort of lamp, actually, and not a painting. It's a kind of cross between a painting and a lamp. So that you could kind of take the painting off the wall, hold it under the kind of main bedroom light for, you know, two minutes or whatever, and um, then go to bed and read by the light of your painting, which kind of gradually faded over a period of about, depending on how long it had been under the light, about 20, 25 minutes. This is uh, <coughs> 19 Borgasa and commemorates a small act of vandalism in that I unscrewed the plaque that was here that told you that it was the Sigmund Freud Museum. Sorry, that projector's still jamming. This is um, a branch of crab apple growing in some uh, apple schnapps. Um, and the uh, fruits take up the alcohol and become alcoholic because they drink in the schnapps. It's a sort of uh, experiment. <coughs> These are... All of this work comes from a time that I spent some time with some friends and um, Colleagues, when I was teaching here, some students came over from the um, Hochschule für Angewandte Kunst in Vienna and asked me to uh, sort of go back with them and do some teaching at their school in Vienna. So uh, I did several months later and spent a summer there where some of these works were, were carried out. Um, this is one of several slides which uh, involved 
uh, taking the names off roses in the rose garden, the, um, in the, the Volksgarten in Vienna, and uh, changing their names around. So uh, there's this idea of kind of uh, messing up the order of things a bit. But they have quite interesting names, like applause, and they quite often have women's names. But there's one called Rot Neon, which I quite liked. Oops, it's autumn on its side. Okay, this is a found photograph. It's quite a long story to this, I won't go into it. It's a photograph that survived from a collection of photographs that were uh, mine for a very brief period of time. And um, it's a Polaroid of, um, I don't know who took the photograph, don't know who the photograph is of, um, but I got someone to, it's a, it, it must have been taken, we think it's probably taken in the early 70s, and the Polaroid stock at that time is so unstable that the image is actually quite fastly disappearing. And I quite like the idea of, uh, of uh, exposing something to the light which would uh, gradually disappear. It would be a sort of marker of time to a certain extent in that you could kind of uh, keep looking at it and it would be less there each time. This, um, again, is a small fragment from kind of a fairly big piece of work, um, which involved taking the screenplay to uh, Les Enfants du Paradis and re-editing it, uh, recutting the thing on paper. There are, in fact, that's a detail of something which is, in fact, something like 240 panels big. And um, it also, is, it's accompanied by a two-screen video projection which involves recutting small sequences from the film. Um, the original piece of work that this sort of came from being a, I found a 35 millimeter English subtitled uh, section of the print of the film and became interested in it and uh, decided to in fact uh, re-edit the film with kind of quite uh, serious consequences to the uh, narrative but uh, very little perceivable to the actual uh, structure of the film. So sort of upholding various uh, editing conventions, but uh, somehow radically retracing aspects of the narrative. These two images are taken in uh, it's an installation that I, I, I made for um, a group show which was held in this church um, in Venice at the time of the Venice Biennale, what must now be uh, three years ago. Um, and I was, you know, with these group shows, you're sort of in discussion as to where your piece of work might go or uh, how it's going to be. And because this church um, was kind of extraordinary, it's deconsecrated church. Um, it had a palladio facade, which was extraordinary. The thing was a, was, was, was a, a double cube. It was an extraordinary shape. It was kind of fiercely symmetrical. And um, that's the thing that struck me about it. And somehow not wishing to kind of ignore the fact, I mean, not wishing to, uh, to ignore the fact that we were actually, in fact, exhibiting in a deconsecrated de church, I um, chose to, in some way, uh, uh, agree or kind of go along with the, um, with the unyielding symmetry of this building and uh, make something that was, in fact, uh, semi-symmetrical but was, in fact, actually quite, uh, quite twisted out of symmetry. There are two trees. Um, one on the left, I think, is 35 years old. The one on the right is 28. You can't really maybe properly see. They're, they're very difficult things to photograph because the neon lights that are behind them, sorry, uh, have, in fact, this is obviously the, this is the one on the, uh, the left-hand side, and uh, it's the name of a, of a woman called, uh, well, it's the name of a woman, Marina Vladi. Marina Vladi is an actress who worked in uh, many f 
theatre productions and films during the 60s. Notably, uh, the thing I'm referencing here is uh, a film made by Jean-Luc Godard called Two or Three Things I Know About Her, where Marina Vladi plays a character called Juliette Janson, um, which is the name behind the tree on the right-hand side. Uh, I could go further into that, but it's a bit of a complicated story. Marina Vladi was 35 when she played the part of this woman who was 28. Who, and I'm sure if any of you will have seen the film, there's this sort of play at the beginning of the film where there's this uh, push and pull to do with the identity of the person and the character. Uh, the character she plays is, in fact, a uh, sort of uh, working class or lower middle class uh, family woman who resorts to prostitution in order to make money so that they can afford uh, smarter objects for their home and go on holidays and things like that. On the Steps is a piece of work by somebody else, um, Adam Chodsko. They're um, bottles of what he calls secreta juice, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't attempt to try and talk about his work, because I think I'd probably get it wrong. But um, we were kind of shit, all sort of sharing this space together, so I was actually quite, actually quite glad that they were there, because they kind of further imbalanced the, the thing in a way. These are um, images taken setting up an exhibition which happened uh, earlier this year in Rome. Um, that's a glass dish on the floor. And by projecting lights into these uh, dishes, you could kind of uh, create these quite spectacular uh, lighting effects, which you could kind of control and could kind of move around the room. I wanted to make something which was uh, um, I don't know, really contemplative in some way maybe. The dishes were eventually filled with water and um, you can just about see there that there are about uh, 10 or 12 tropical fish that are swimming in each of them. And uh, by projecting the lights down into these kinds of, they looked a bit like kind of contact lenses when they were full of water with these fish swimming in. You could kind of create um, something again very difficult to, to, to get a good picture of. But in this kind of uh, abstract blurring here, this kind of, uh, this light effect, you could see, in fact, the shadows of fish swimming across the ceiling, so it had this kind of strange, I wanted to make something which, um, which was a, a little less like an object and more like um, the, the, uh, the sight of an experience. I also wanted to make something that I thought kind of children would like. This is on the roof of that gallery and has a different, has a different uh, sort of related to the piece downstairs. The, the two installation shots, you can see um, he's uh, someone who helped me install the piece. He's a, a pyrotechnician who um, lives in Rome and he's installing a, a sentence which is written in fireworks um, which says, take your desires for reality which uh, on the night of the opening, as soon as it got dark, we set off and everyone got up onto the roof and there was this sort of performative aspect to that. It burnt for one minute. In English. So again, installation shots of this. Uh, the mirrors that I had on the floor in Rome um, <coughs> weren't really quite as sharp as I'd wanted to make them. So um, I'd made the glass ones first um, because what I really wanted to do was kind of play around with what the mirrors did. So in, in a sense, what I did with the ones in Rome by filling them with kind of fish and water and putting lights in them was uh, not something that I'd originally planned to do. It came as a sort of accident from, from, from the way that they were made. Um, 
in a sense, I'm kind of fighting against myself here by trying to describe the effect of these things because uh, it really is far more in the experience of kind of negotiating your appearance in front of these things and, and, and how it uh, distorts the room around you. Uh, again, I'm using an exit sign, but this time I've kind of turned it back to front and upside down, which is, of course, what mirrors do. So, in fact, the only thing that you could actually get your sort of bearing to in the room was, uh, you know, you're perceiving yourself kind of radically disrupted and distorted as an image, but the only thing that you can see and read the right way up is the word exit, which is, uh, which is read kind of uh, as you'd expect it in the reflection. Again, there's just a um, series of shots here of various installation shots of these things. Might give you a better idea of exactly kind of what it does. Concave mirrors do in, in, in principle, depending on, their, depending on their, their radius of curvature, they will uh, always invert an image until a point at which you come uh, towards the center of a mirror at which your uh, reflection is magnified enormously. Um, you take that point further in towards the surface of the mirror, you become smaller and, as it were, the right way up. So the photograph on the left-hand side here is, in fact, the correct way up because that's how I appear in the room at that point taking the photograph. Uh, there are other mirrors set up in this room which, uh, again, it's a sort of an, an experiment which um, I wasn't particularly didn't come to much. I thought it might be interesting to kind of further increase this kind of distortion by kind of having one distort another, distort another, but in fact led to a kind of formalism which uh, ended up making the things look a bit like sculpture, which is sort of not really what I had in mind. Uh, you get an idea of there vaguely on the right hand side of uh, a person who's standing in front of the mirror. Uh, you, you see the top of his head that big um, from where I'm taking the photograph. So it, they kind of they create these uh, quite sort of monstrous distortions, which I was interested in not capturing somehow, but somehow giving people a, a presenting them with this kind of experience, which kind of led them to kind of be fairly mildly kind of hysterical in the presence of these things. Oops. Um, this comes <coughs> to a little earlier, uh, I mean, this is a little later on. This is a show that I uh, contributed towards in Paris, at the Museum of Modern Art there. And uh, again, you have a detail here on the left-hand side of a, a detail close-up of this firework, which was installed in the museum on this enormous curved wall. It's in fact a, uh, an appropriation of this text, which was further, I mean, which had initially been appropriated by uh, various anonymous situationists. Uh, this being a kind of English version of a comic which appeared, I think, originally in Paris, which I don't know, it must have been around, uh, I don't know, the late 60s at some point. So the firework actually uh, spells out the Marx quote at the top, and somehow I felt that. Uh, um, I don't know, it's, it, would take, it would take a bit of a, a longer discussion for me to kind of maybe uh, go into why exactly I chose that quote or why I felt that this kind of uh, re-incandescence, this literalization of this quote in, in kind of fire words uh, in some way had a, contributed to uh, the meaning of quoting it again somehow. <coughs> Also in the exhibition, I had these, uh, I had these orchids um, bred for me um, by a nursery outside Paris, and um, they are in fact a hybrid that was uh, that was kind of altered specially for me. They're in fact uh, they're called Phalaenopsis allegria, and their parents orchids hybrid orchids have they called they're called parents. Their parents are, in fact, um, in fact, I can't remember their names now. Um, 
the names of two, uh, I, I, should, I, I don't know, it would be interesting maybe to find out a bit more about who these people were, but their parents are both female, um, or both ne have female names. Um, they also did, um, they did very well, went back to see them in um, about three weeks ago, and they'd been there for about two and a half months, I think. No, less than that, two months maybe. And uh, they also survive on, uh, they are fed with um, my urine, which was produced from drinking a kind of um, vanilla, uh, vanilla alcohol. <laughs> orchids produce, orchids make vanilla. And they're sort of there being, being uh, vaguely <coughs> symmetrical. <laughs> that's a photograph I took in the, oh no, sorry, this is that's really something, this is the big ending, sorry, ruining it all for you, great finale, exposed, okay, let's go forward, okay, these were kind of very funny little um, laminated bits of uh, paper in the shop um, in the shop where I uh, in the shop of the nursery with, that, that made the orchids for me they're kind of something very uh, something very creepy there these are photographs I took in Kew Gardens um, it's been in June this year of this extraordinary event which is this flower which you can see in the center of the picture which is called a Titan Arium, and um, the kind of mob scenes surrounding this flower, which, uh, to my knowledge, flowers only for four days every 70 years, and is in fact extremely rare, um, and comes from uh, some jungle area in Sumatra. I think this is the only one known to be, as it were, in kind of captivity. And there was, th there was something just so strange about this, something so, uh, so odd. Um, unfortunately, all the garden conservation people are probably upstairs having their party in the library, but um, it seemed to me that uh, there was something very strange about this event, people's fascination with it. The flower allegedly also smells of rotting flesh, so uh, you had a kind of lot of excited children kind of coming up and claiming that they could smell it. Maybe their, their sense of smell is better than mine, but I couldn't. But, you know, it's surrounded by police and video cameras and... Uh, just seemed very odd that a plant could in some way uh, operate, I don't know, have this kind of spectacular quality to it. I found it very, uh, really interesting. That might be it, Marvin. So, um, <coughs> I don't know how long that took, probably quite a long time. But if you had any Anything to say? Could you explain the title of the lecture? The title of the lecture is, in fact, the title of the uh, firework text piece, which is in Paris. And um, it's probably my fault for not having described it properly, I mean, not having spelt it out correctly over the phone, but it's, in fact... Um, misspelt on the poster and in the events list. Um, the title is, it's in fact a Latin palindrome that was also the title of a film and a subsequent book by uh, the uh, late French situationist Guy Debord. And uh, the title is In Girum Imus Nocte et Consumimur Igni, which is uh, a palindrome being that which, uh, which is reversed in the middle. It has a symmetry to it. Um, so when you get to the middle of that phrase, it actually kind of uh, reverses itself and, 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 and goes back to the beginning, as it were. And the text is roughly translated. There are several translations of it from the Latin into the French, from the French into the English, roughly as um, we turn and turn through the night and are consumed by fire.
I think it's... You're giving a, you're getting, you're I'm all for it, now. yes. I feel as if I'm betraying my work partly. Right. Mm. So to someone who comes to your work, <laughs> to make their own mind. I think there needs to be, there needs to be a certain, mm. I think there's an element in the construction of a piece of work which is, I mean, many artists have used kind of notions of, say, a kind of privileged point for the viewer or that there's a point at which maybe things kind of form some kind of alignment so the viewer might find that alignment by somehow having clues, you know, not just exactly putting kind of, you know, white footprints on the floor or whatever, but yeah. there's, 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 there's a lot of that. So to a certain extent, no, it is important because um, there's also another, it's another element to be able to have, it's another freedom, it's another thing that you're able to work with. Is, is the commentary, is the level to which you allow a commentary to exist as, you know, because people are always looking at, you know, what was your intention in doing this? Yeah. So, my. So you my like the commentary you're making now. Yeah. And you said you felt you were betraying the work. And do you supply a commentary of any sort? Oh, I'm being flippant, I think, partly, right. yes. No, I mean, th there's, there's, there's uh, a point at which I want the, the viewer, perhaps, to. Um, which is extremely manipulative um, to experience a certain unknowing, a certain discomfort in the presence of a piece of work, an, an obstacle in the way somehow, but to recognise that obstacle as being part of the experience of the work, actually being part of the work. Yeah. And what's involved in actually being that kind of bloody minded about it. It's uh, at the very core. Um, you know, that's that's the game. That's that that's the game I'm playing. It feels right to have said that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I don't feel as if I'm uh, lying by saying that. Um, gets a bit complicated, I think, the next bit, because um, you have to uh, enter into these, you have to in enter into a kind of construction which is always looking at the opposite of what you're trying to say or mean. That, 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 that it, that it's a thing with sides, I think, this kind of, uh, um, it's me saying, you know, um, I'm lying now, no, I'm telling the truth now, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a figure that's, that's um, part of the experience of making the work is wanting to kind of involve that kind of figure, like a double figure, but it's not really quite as simple as seeing, you know, what's on a man's mind and seeing kind of Sigmund Freud's cartoon and then seeing the fact that it's made out of naked ladies or whatever. I mean, it's not that kind of switch. Yeah. It's a bit like seeing the moon and when you can see it as a sphere. You know, sometimes you can see somehow you can kind of convince yourself that you can see it as a sphere. Other times, you just see it as a kind of almost like a kind of cut-out shape, as a representation of a. It feels flat sometimes. Um, other people did. People were. Um, people were. I don't know. It's odd to have made a piece of work that was attractive in that way to people, because people asked me to. Someone asked me whether they could take a photograph of someone else in the mirror and use it as a book jacket cover. Someone else has approached me because they wanted to make a film with um, two identical twins and use the mirror. Someone else has approached me who wants to make a pop video and use the mirror as a prop. But they are the same. Not really. They, 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 Yeah, there's a. That. But there's a point where you, when you flip, when you actually become the right way, when you're looking at the moon in the mirror, it made a crack noise. And I just wondered if you filmed someone moving closer to the wall, because I was particularly enjoying that yeah. shot. In a sense, it would be for. In a sense, it would. I feel it would kind of undermine the work somehow by putting it into that level of representing the work. Because as soon as someone had seen the film, somehow the film would be a, a kind of. Uh, 
be a document of the work and not the work, because I think what I'd rather have is people who have that experience for themselves instead of see someone else represented in that way, because... Um, Uh, yeah, I try and try and keep it as sort of as, as as live to that moment as possible, really. And you know, people people have bought these mirrors. It was an edition uh, of three of the ones that you saw here. The title of the piece is called Inverse, Reverse, Perverse, which I suppose sort of sums things up. There might have been a better title for the for the lecture, but um, there's that aspect um, that I want to I don't know that there's that aspect that I wanted to encourage. Um, that's certainly a kind of willful disclosure as a title, I think, because it's about um, it's sort of a description of what the mirror, how it works. It's odd because it's, it's, it's something that um, creates a lot of strange effects which aren't very easy to, because it is this, it is a kind of monocular construction and it's actually based on, very roughly, um, based on the kinds of proportions which are at the back of your retina. So it's a kind of model of an eye in the first place. Yeah. Um, so having two eyes and being faced somehow with this kind of cyclops, um, creates um, slippages, creates things that can't easily be contained. So uh, I was pleased that I was able to somehow make something that was a sort of generator of, uh, of, of, of possibilities, of distortions, of slippages, um, and that there was something that... Uh, to photograph it would be to go into photographing a kind of an inventory of effects that the thing could, could, um, could generate. No, but if I showed you a whole load of pictures of um, someone from a magazine came to the gallery and said that they wanted to take some pictures, some portraits of me in the thing, and you could just, standing fairly close to this thing is a slightly disturbing experience because you don't actually know, the thing is so clean, you don't actually know where the space is, and you're not <coughs> used to seeing yourself in, in that kind of way. So standing there feeling slightly kind of nauseous standing close to this thing, whereas the photographer behind me was going, wow, yeah, great, keep it there, and I had no idea what that was about. Um, similarly, when there was more than one person in the gallery, you had this strange tension between, you know, people would boss each other around, which was interesting as well. People were like, no, you go there, you go there, ah, you know, you'd have this kind of, because people's faces go that big, you know. And there are very strange photographs that came out of that kind of photo session because you see yourself, you know, with a nose that long or you see yourself kind of totally eaten away. It's... Uh <laughs> it's, uh, it's also recognizably the same but different. And the title of the mirror, this inverse, reverse, perverse, sort of gives you a bit of a handle as to actually what sort of method you, you're actually engaging in. Um, and just how it is that somehow you maintain a kind of form of continuity through the three dimensions, but keep sort of putting the poetic. Well, um, yeah, I hope so. I mean, that's, that's what I... Um, in a sense, what's difficult, and the last thing I want to keep doing is kind of apologising for being here, but it's strange if you can imagine, because it's not something I do, is kind of put all the slides up in a row and just go, yeah, I did that, did that, did that, and look at it in this kind of condensed period of time and perform this brief history in this period of time and just say... Um, Somehow I don't think it's for me to, or it's not useful for me, it's not interesting to me, for me to kind of draw conclusions from 
an overview on that. I have a sort of fantasy of, um, you know, what would happen if Brian comes along and, you know, writes something that says, you know, this is what this artist is about, this is what th this person's interests are, because it's interesting to see that kind of reflected somewhere else. It's not as if I have a very clear-cut agenda as to, there's no clear program. Um, you know, I'm not a sort of, uh, I don't think of myself as a sort of systems artist who has kind of set out, to, uh, I don't have a kind of uh, list of commandments that I try and follow. Or if I recognize that there are some creeping in, I try and undermine those by, um, by gnawing away at them or by doing something that will actually, um, I'll find sort of displeasing in a way. I think the property of being fey is very underrated in that kind of way. The property of being kind of weak and fey and ephemeral is something that, uh, see, I've done it again. I'm now going to go off and make some kind of great big butch sculpture or something in order to kind of um, try and undermine the... But no, I'm getting closer to the idea of, um, of trying to say something that I suppose I'm meaning there um, to do with... I don't know really what's at stake in in admitting that I want to uh, undermine the last thing I did by creating something else. It probably comes out of some sort of deep sense of sort of disappointment or something. But um, I was interested in the orchids because I found them particularly um, unattractive in a way. And um, sort of precious in a sense that alluded to things that I found uninteresting in a powerful way, like um, aspects of kind of the floral in art or aspects of the appropriation of plant forms in order to construct... Uh I have to watch myself now because I'm just kind of getting into deep water. I'm not exactly sure whether I'm totally agreeing with what I'm saying, but... Um, there's this kind of decorative aspect, there's a kind of desperate aspect also to the uh, propagation of these rare, expensive hybrids. There's something, uh, there's something a bit dodgy about it, I feel, somehow. And, um, Well, yeah, pa pa if people are running away from, it, from something, then I'm, I'm probably a, a bit more interested in it for that reason. Um, the idea also, I like the idea very much of, because the only times that I've shown these flowers, they've been in situations where they've been in shows. So the most recent use of these flowers was in the Museum of Modern Art in Paris, which means that, you know, once a day in the evening, someone who works in the museum has got to go to a cupboard somewhere and get a bottle of my urine and go to the plant and spray the plant with it and keep the plant going and worry if the blossom looks as if it's going to fall off. And I wanted to somehow kind of implicate a kind of care around these plants. I wanted somehow to, um, to make, make someone do something with the object, make have an interaction with 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 something that I had in, in, I had placed there that I had in fact taken great care to kind of place there in a very particular particular way, and um, so the kind of care and maintenance of these things as an issue as a problem is something that I think the work is attempting to do there um, because the, you know these things don't live forever then they're, they're they're certainly objects, but they're only objects in that particular sense for a short period of time. So it was a question of kind of, even on a kind of formal sculptural level, looking at uh, temporality as part of a medium that you could use, and knowing that if the show was on for, show's on for a hundred days, and the, uh, the woman at the nursery who kind of got these flowers ready for me just the week before the thing, <coughs> They can tweak around with these things quite a lot. They're kind of incredibly, uh, incredibly highly kind of manufactured natural objects. You know, it's like yes, I'll get one. So you want replacements by the end of November, she said. So you know, 
what do you fancy? We'll have these ready by then. So I go, well, you know, why don't we try on to Glossom? You know, why don't we try another? And she goes, yeah, these will be ready. So I put these aside for you, and I'll know to be able to feed them. She filled out in her notebook, you know, first week of November, extra potassium for, you know, and that, that kind of uh, grooming of the thing for an event and the kind of uh, strange implications of that. And also there are all kinds of stories around, ar around orchids, around people's kinds of fetishistic kind of attraction to them, their kind of uh, their, their sexual symbolism, um, Proust's love of them, uh, Lacan uh, giving for a period of time Jean Moreau sending her orchids every day. I mean, it was kind of, you get involved in a subject and then you kind of find out more and more about it because you're like right in the middle of it. And then you find out that there was this kind of weird war that was going on between these two people and she hated orchids and he thought, and so there's this, the way that they're given as well and the way that they're, the way that they're used, they're quite often used to sort of symbolize some kind of rare but slightly dark thing going on. It sort of it would have been for my own records, which would have been something that I'd have sort of you know kept in a drawer at home and kind of maybe it could have turned into something else at some point. Uh, no, in a sense, it sort of gives me more uh, more pleasure to just know that this thing must be going on somehow without me actually being there or without me being kind of um, without me having to draw a line which is completely closed around the whole experience, the whole um, experience as an object. Maybe it what would be it? frightening to think that you were actually encouraging people's creativity. <laughs> Yeah, there's not, um, you can sort of guess. I mean, you know what the thing does, and it's quite, it's quite, quite powerful what, what it does, the way it just turns things upside down in that way. So quite simple, they're quite light things, you know, turning something back to front or upside down. Well, it's a kind of long history to that too. That whole sort of fairground thing of, as well is quite attractive because people, you know, people are running away from people are running away from effects in work, which I don't have too much of a problem with. I think probably uh, as the school is about to be turned into a party, any minute, <laughs> we should probably uh, wind it up here. Um, I'd like to thank Karis. I'd also like to say that uh, there's a bit of a break in the lectures until next term on the 17th. We resume. Um, Dorothy Cross, who has an exhibition at the Frith Street opening on the 16th, will be giving the next lecture on Friday the 17th. But in the meantime, I'd like to thank Karen for coming along. <laughs>